Summary of For Cause and Comrades by James McPherson Letters and diaries written by American Civil War warriors show more than any other war could about why they joined and fought in the war. James McPherson, a historian, has looked at the works of 1,076 men, both Union and Confederate, to tell the story of why they fought, as much as possible in their own words. All of the letters and diaries in McPherson's sample were unedited and had never been published. When he looked at these papers, he thought about three types of motivation, why men joined the army in the first place, why they kept fighting, and what gave them the courage to face danger on the battlefield. During the first two years of the Civil War, from 1861 to 1862, almost all of the men signed up on their own. Both Union and Confederate troops saw themselves as joining up to fight for freedom. They also saw themselves as fighting to keep the tradition of the Founding Fathers alive. Both sides were also highly affected by the idea of duty, which was very important in Victorian America and was linked to how men were seen at the time. Even if troops were excited to fight at first because they thought it would be exciting and bring them fame, their first battles often left them disappointed. Even though it was considered shameful to show fear, all troops had to learn how to deal with the fear and dread of battle. McPherson talks about both the outside and the inside reasons why men did this. Training, discipline, and guidance were all outward signs. Even though Americans liked democracy, they didn't like being told what to do. Instead, they tended to respect brave leaders who were willing to share their men's responsibilities and risks. McPherson finds, though, that internal motives were more powerful in the long run. Religion, mostly Protestant Christianity, was the strongest of these. Many troops wrote that they were resigned to the fact that God was in charge of what happened on the battlefield. However, this resignation, along with the widespread belief in endless life after death, seemed to give many soldiers the courage to fight bravely. Both Union and Confederate troops were firm in their belief that God was on their side of the war. Many soldiers found it hard to reconcile the Christian message that you shouldn't kill with the brutality of war. At the same time, though, the importance of honor in the culture and the fear of weakness and shame drove many people to fight. Since many companies were made up of men from the same town, lasting friendships and the fear of being called a coward back home helped to strengthen a sense of brotherhood, which in turn made the men more eager to fight. Even after years of hard fighting, this band of brothers feeling made many people want to join up again. Even though what McPherson calls primary group cohesion was a big factor, moral beliefs were also important for keeping people motivated and ready to fight. McPherson says that many Civil War soldiers were publicly active when they joined the army, and that they stayed that way through the war. Union soldiers also wrote strongly about what they saw as the traitorous breakup of the Union by secessionists. This made the anger of the Confederates, who were already very patriotic, even stronger. Respect for the revolutionaries who came before them was a big part of pride on both sides. Yet, in what McPherson calls a profound irony, Union and Confederate forces had very different ideas about what 1776 meant. Union soldiers thought they were fighting to keep the Union together, while Confederate soldiers thought they were fighting against President Lincoln's tyranny. Confederates talked about fighting against enslavement by the North, but they also said that they wanted to keep slavery alive in the South. Even troops whose families did not own slaves sometimes talked about fighting against the idea of race equality. Early Union soldiers rarely talked about slavery, except to say that getting rid of it would hurt the Confederacy. However, meeting Southern slaves, seeing how bad the economy was, and taking in runaway slaves all helped Northerners become more against slavery. Union troops were often racist, and many of them fought against Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1862 and 1863. Some of them didn't like how the war's goals seemed to change. But more people changed their minds when black Union troops were formed and did well. By 1864, only a small number of people were against black regiments. When Lincoln ran for re-election on a strong anti-slavery ticket, he won with 80% of the soldier support. Over the course of the war, McPherson sees a clear shift from realism, or even outright unwillingness, to principle among Union troops when it came to slavery. 
both Union and Confederate soldiers got a big boost in confidence from letters from home. This was especially true for men who felt pulled between their duty to their family and their duty to their country. Other things happening at home, like letting drafted men hire replacements to fight for them and the rise of copperheads, or anti-war peace democrats, could be a big blow to military confidence. The Victorian Code of Honor gave many soldiers a darker reason to get payback, especially Confederates who often talked badly about Yankees and Unions in border states where there were Confederate guerrillas. McPherson says that payback talk is the dark underside of morale and drive. 1864 was the bloodiest year of the war. Even though soldiers were breaking down more often, many, including early volunteers, stayed true to ideas of duty and honor and chose to re-enlist even when things were the worst. Early in 1865, the badly hurt Confederacy was so eager to keep fighting that they reluctantly let a small number of black men join their ranks. Union confidence stayed high until the end of the war. This was helped by Lincoln's re-election. McPherson ends his study by mentioning an Ohio captain who, near the end of the war, told his young son that he was still fighting to make sure that every American citizen, no matter what race they were, had the rights guaranteed by the Declaration of Independence. He told his young son to live up to that legacy, and McPherson says that modern Americans must also constantly look at themselves to make sure they are living up to that same legacy. About the author James M. McPherson is a very well-known Civil War scholar. McPherson was born in Minnesota and went to college at Gustavus Adolphus. He then got his Ph.D. at Johns Hopkins University, where he studied under another famous American historian, C. Van Woodward. In his early research, McPherson looked at abolitionism and social change during the Civil War. McPherson got the Pulitzer Prize in 1988 for his book Battle Cry of Freedom, which was an academic history of the Civil War that also became a popular book, selling over 600,000 copies. For Cause and Comrades, 1998, and Tried by War, Abraham Lincoln as Commander-in-Chief, 2009, both nonfiction books about the Civil War, won the Gettysburg College Lincoln Prize. McPherson has worked hard to keep Civil War battlefields and other important spots in good shape. He has been an Emeritus Professor of United States History at Princeton University since 1962. McPherson and his wife Patricia live in New Jersey at the moment. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.